Thank you, Chairs Moore and Felipe and ranking members Samson and Scott and my distinguished colleagues on the Housing Committee. Uh, I'm excited today to testify in favor of House Bill 5333. I think it's long overdue after over 30 years that we re-examine and eventually change State Statute 830G. I always like to start with things that I think most of us can agree on. First and foremost, I think we all agree that a government that governs closest to the people governs best. When you put local communities, towns and cities and their officials in the lead, they can make decisions best for their community than a state government or certainly a federal government can. Second, I think we all agree that we need to create a housing market and a policy regime in this state that makes affordability and access to housing possible and even more likely than it is currently. Under those two standards, I think 830G is currently failing our state. First of all, it creates this adversarial relationship between communities and the state government and a very unhappy relationship at that. Any time when a developer can build a 100-unit complex in a single-family zone neighborhood, as is currently being proposed under 830G in my district alone, I don't think it's fair to the residents of that district, and I don't think it's a sustainable paradigm where we can have buy-in from local communities across the state. At the same time, over the last 30 years that 830G has been in place, we've actually seen poverty increase in the state. So we're not, with the laws currently on the books, we're not able to generate the upward mobility and reductions in poverty that we all want to see in the state. I think there are better alternatives by which we can put our local communities in the driver's seat, increase local control, and actually reduce housing costs and increase availability across the state. Over the last couple of years, I've introduced bipartisan pieces of legislation with uh, Representative Ali Brennan uh, that would try to accomplish those goals, reform 830G, increase local input, and reduce the cost of housing. Five of those proposals include rewarding towns for allowing more naturally occurring affordable housing rather than only government housing or deed restricted housing under the current law. Second is to create a maximum height on any building development under 830G, which is similar to what Massachusetts does in its state law. Third is to make 830G based on the total number of affordable units rather than a percentage of all the existing housing stock. One of the ways that I think 830G fails to actually increase the overall housing stock or housing availability in our communities is because it creates um, this kind of contradiction for localities that they're actually penalized when they allow workforce housing or middle income or lower middle income housing to be built because in order to satisfy 830G, you need to reach a 10% threshold. And if you allow lower middle income housing to be built or middle income housing to be built that your community supports, it actually increases your denominator. And even though we would all agree that that probably makes our housing markets better, it actually creates a disincentive for towns because they get farther away from their 10% threshold under 830G. I think we should make it easier for towns to receive moratoriums. Uh, under 830G, there's been towns that have been denied moratoriums under 830G, even though they're adding dozens and dozens or hundreds of affordable units in a short period of time. And finally, we should allow more 830G housing points for senior housing, for transit-oriented housing, for new residential housing in mixed-use commercial office zoned areas, and new accessory dwelling apartments as well. These are just some of the bipartisan ideas that would give towns more flexibility. I think as you step back, now these are these are my preferences, but as you step back, I think eventually down the line, what we'd really like to see and what might actually be possible is a sort of a grand bargain, a bipartisan bargain in the state on housing, where we roll back some of the mandates on our towns that are unfair to our towns and create an adversarial relationship, but also open up state policy to more middle housing and workforce housing, things like accessory dwelling units, things like residential housing units in mixed use uh, in, in commercially zoned areas. That's, I think, a paradigm that's working elsewhere in the country. 
Whereas 830G is a very heavy handed, all or nothing, one size fits all type approach and other proposals that are in a similar vein, perhaps could create an even unhappier situation in the state. So I'm always open to a conversation. I think that when we work together across the aisle, when we put localities in charge, we get the best results. Uh, so I hope that this bill passes this year as just a first step to finally reforming 830G, putting our communities in the lead and actually reducing the cost of housing for our residents. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Senator. Uh... Senator Sampson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator, for being here. Uh, thank you for the enlightening uh, testimony. I, I took notes. Uh, and between you and Senator Wong, I've got a, a nice list of things that I think uh, should absolutely be included in our final uh, proposal. Um, and I could ask you a lot more detail on on any one of these items. Uh, but before I do that, is there any one that you would like to cover a little bit more thoroughly that you did just kind of gave us a brief description? I, I, I really do want to emphasize, and and one of the things, uh, you know, I, I'd like to commend our colleagues, the, the majority leaders. I think they're their task force in the off season has been productive. It's been it's served as a venue for a constructive conversation between legislators. I know uh, uh, some of the members of this committee are on it and have been privy to those conversations in public. But I do want to emphasize: I don't think 830G is been productive in helping us increase our workforce housing and middle housing stock because of that percentage kind of situation where if you allow as a town, if you allow middle income housing or lower middle income housing to even affordable housing, that's lower than 60% of the median income, if it's not deed restricted or not government housing, you actually get penalized under 830G. So I think we're in a weird situation where we have this very adversarial state statute that is making communities very unhappy because it's sort of reducing their input on decision making, but it's actually not meeting its goal of increasing the overall availability of housing either. So I, I want to continue to socialize that premise that was a topic of conversation on the majority leaders task force in the off season. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And uh, it makes perfect sense. Obviously, it's it's a shame that the way the, the statute is currently written, it is uh, preventing the very uh, thing that uh, it aims to actually uh, attempt to require. Um, and, and this goes hand in hand with the, the first point that you made, which was about rewarding towns for naturally occurring. It's, it's basically the same concept. It, have you uh, put any thought into the notion of uh, maybe um, how we treat uh, naturally occurring existing, uh, what would be affordable housing if it was government housing or deed restricted uh, versus new construction type uh, middle income uh, or workforce housing like you just described? Um, is, is that maybe a, a compromise that is on the table? Because um, I, don't, I don't know that we're going to get some of the folks that are that are adamant about the current status of 830G to agree to accommodate the naturally occurring as it is, but maybe going forward, j just throwing that out there for your uh, reaction. Yeah, the way the way I designed the proposal under allowing naturally occurring affordable housing, so affordable housing that's actually affordable in terms of the rents, but it's neither deed restricted nor government supported housing. The way I think that towns could be given the option, they don't even have to be forced, but they can get, be given the option to count that towards their 830G accounting would be to require them to find some sort of proof, whether it's an affidavit or a lease, that it is indeed affordable. And second, give also give those towns the ability to provide a tax abatement to those property owners who are providing affordable housing in order to reward them for doing so. And also for coming forward and providing proof that they're doing so. So allow the towns to both verify and incentivize more of that naturally occurring affordable housing. Under 830G, what you really see is kind of these all or nothing scenarios where developers come in with these gigantic proposals in order to create economies of scale. When really, I think the towns, if, if we design our policy right, you would see a lot more discrete affordable housing pop up here and there that actually would be easy to construct, easy to be made available to the general public, whether it's an accessory dwelling unit, 
um, or other type apartments uh, here and there across town rather than, again, 100 units in a single family neighborhood, which is permitted and which is currently being advanced in in, uh, in my district. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and, and one of the things that um, is quite clear that, you know, developers, obviously, they want to maximize their uh, investment, and um, they can actually use the 830G statute as leverage uh, to force communities into into doing things they wouldn't otherwise do. And that's something we've got to get at. So you're absolutely correct about that. The, the final thing I want to ask you about, uh, Senator, is the, um, the moratorium issue. You mentioned that uh, there are communities that really should be eligible, but they're they're not being granted their moratoriums. Just if you, you might speak to that, uh, how we could revise the statute to maybe make it a little easier for some of those communities. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman. Basically, I would allow the towns to bank their affordable units that they previously built but did not count towards a moratorium. Um, that probably is permitted under statute. The housing department probably has discretion, but there is examples currently of towns who I think should be permitted to have a moratorium that aren't getting it because say they need 50 affordable units for a moratorium under 830G and they built 54 units um, and then they got a moratorium and then they built another 46 units and they still needed, they needed another 50 for a second moratorium. Well, those four that those four extra that weren't needed for the first moratorium weren't eligible to be included in the second. And the reason I think it's a good idea is not because you necessarily need to give all these towns moratoriums, but you need to create a system of incentives for the towns to create affordable housing. If you create this highly complex, unfriendly, unpredictable system, then towns actually are just going to kind of um, fold their arms and 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 not actually put an effort forward or are less likely to put an effort forward to create the affordable housing because it is costly. I mean, it does, you know, it, it, it does fall on property taxpayers in order to do some of this public housing. So I think there's just a logical way to create more incentive and reward towns who are trying to put their best foot forward and reforming the moratorium process would go a long way to accomplishing that. Thank you very much, Senator. I appreciate your comments very much today. I will have a lot more questions, but I will certainly uh, be speaking with you offline and uh, we'll make sure to include you in the discussions going forward. And I, I know that the P&D committee is also uh, looking at this issue as well. So uh, between us, I hope we get to a, a finish line that has some uh, productive results this year. And thank you so much. for Thank being you, here. Senator. Thank you, Madam Chairman.